Hey, do you appreciate your choir? Let's give them a round of applause again. Yeah. Well, as you might guess, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7 of the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke 2, 1 through 7. And would you stand in honor of God's Word? And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cernius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the land of David, which is called Bethlehem, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Father, this morning again, we pray you guide us in your word. We celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, that you do, God, Believe and love us, that you love us, Lord, and have called us to believe you, that you are indeed God with us, Emmanuel, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. The passage that we just read is, of course, the traditional, the familiar story of how Jesus Christ came into the world. I want to talk to you this morning about the truth that in Bethlehem's manger lay the answer, and on Calvary's cross came the solution. Into a world of sin comes the sinless Son of God. As the angels sang, no doubt all hell reeled because the truth is that the gospel says that God became one of us. Emmanuel, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I don't know what kind of packaging your Christmas gifts have come in. Pretty bags, wonderful paper, or sometimes there has to be some other creative way to do it. But God's greatest gift to us came in the package of a baby laid in a manger in Bethlehem. The Bible says that God's grace came to us in the reality of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We were sinners, but Jesus made our problem his problem. In Bethlehem's manger lay the answer. On Calvary's cross came the solution. Into a world of impurity comes the virgin born Son of God. Now, for 2,000 years, the devil has been trying to deny that breathtaking miracle. He's questioned Mary and Joseph's virtue claimed some Roman soldier assaulted Mary, made all kind of crazy accusations. He's tried to claim that Jesus Christ only appeared to be human. I bet you couldn't have told Mary that. Amen? Amen. John had to dispel that lie more than once. In John 1.14, the verse that we often quote around Christmas, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, he says, Our hands have handled of the Word of life. Again, the virgin born Son of God. John says, I know that Jesus was human. And Mary and Joseph knew, and we know that he was the virgin born Son of God into this big old nasty sinful world, impure world, messed up world. Jesus came in all his purity in the midst of the reality of an actual human birth there is God. What happened that day in Bethlehem's manger? What happened that day when Jesus was born was very similar to the birth of other babies except that he was who he was. In Bethlehem's manger lay the answer. On Calvary's cross came the solution. Into a world of division comes the reconciling Son of God. God promised Abraham in Genesis twenty two eighteen, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It's seed singular, it's Jesus. In 
Luke 2.10, the angel of the Lord says to the shepherds, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. I dare say probably everyone in the sound of my voice this morning is a Gentile, Gentile origin. If you're not, praise God. But the truth is, the Bible comes and tells us that Jesus came for all people. Of us. In Jesus' day, the Jews and Gentiles generally didn't much like each other. I think in the first century, there might have been some of them saying, Jewish lives matter, and some others saying, well, all lives matter, but they'd have both been right, wouldn't they? But to God, all souls matter. That's the message of Christmas, the coming of Jesus into the world. How could man be reconciled not only with God, but also with man? Well, in Bethlehem's manger lay the answer. On Calvary's cross came the solution. I don't think any government or any politician will ever fix that. But when we come to Jesus, we're reconciled with God and with other Christians, aren't we? Because of the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Into a world of pride comes the humble Son of God. Jesus would remind us, recorded in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. It's an interesting part of the story that the wise men went looking in Jerusalem for a proud king's baby. That makes sense. They they figured out from the star that the king of Israel is going to be born soon. So naturally, they head to Jerusalem, which is the capital city, of that part of the world. Makes perfect sense. They don't find Jesus in Jerusalem, do they? They find Jesus a few miles away in Bethlehem of Judea. Not the child of some proud king, but the child of a humble peasant girl, and of course, Almighty God Himself. That we might take a rest from our silly pride in the presence of Him. How do we humble ourselves? How do do we get past our inborn pride? You can take little kids, little bitty kids, and they are already building up a pride shield. Mine. I did it. You don't have to tie my shoes. I can do it. I put on my own pants. (laughs) And that's good. But we're proud. How do we break through that? Well, in Bethlehem's manger lay the answer. On Calvary's cross came the solution, didn't it? Into a world of greed comes the generous Son of God. John 10, 10 quotes Jesus and says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. One of the wonderful things that I hope we know from Christmas is it really isn't the cost of the gift, it's the heart of the person given. Amen? Amen? But above all, Jesus came to give us the greatest gift, salvation and an abundant life. Now, I don't know if you've ever gotten a gift that was far better than you thought. You know, like you, you got something and you thought, well, I don't know if I need this or not. Never really thought of it. But once you get it, you're like, hey, this is great. I, I didn't get a smartphone as a gift, but I got me a smartphone a few months ago. Everybody been saying, man, those things are nice, you know. They're handy, aren't they? But folks, let me tell you about the greatest gift you ever got that got better and better. The odds are that you came to Jesus because you didn't want to go to hell. Got to get saved. You're convicted. But folks, once you come to Jesus, you discover the rich, abundant life that is personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it gets better and better and better. It never wears out. It gets better. The longer you walk with Jesus, the greater it gets and the more you grow. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it the gift that not only keeps on giving, but keeps on getting better? Knowing Him makes us want to give. Paul quotes Jesus in Acts 20, 35, where he says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Probably, probably, I'm not putting the guilt on anybody this morning, but probably you are, I hope, more excited about seeing somebody you love open a gift than you are about opening a gift that somebody gave you. You know, we're excited about that. We're like, I can't wait till they see what I got them. I hope. 
Because it is more blessed to give than to receive. For decades, Paul himself labored in faithful giving service. And I think he was able to give because on the road to Damascus, he received the gift of Christ himself, didn't he? And we know that when God gives us his great gift, he anticipates the day when a lost soul says, I will receive the free gift of salvation. You think you're excited about giving somebody a gift today you may have given or are going to give later today? I guarantee you the Bible says there is more joy in heaven over one soul that repents than over 99 just people that need no repentance. Oh my goodness gracious, what a wonderful gift because in Bethlehem's manger lay the answer and on Calvary's cross came the solution. Into a world of domination comes the sacrificial son of God. Oh, people try to dominate each other and boss and rule and control and get the upper hand. Well, that's silly, isn't it? Mark 10 45 says, Jesus says, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Rhetorical question on Christmas morning Do you know any really happy people that are only out for themselves? to get what they can get, and to control other people. Well, they're the most miserable people in all the world, aren't they? But the Bible says that Jesus came to give. But how do we break our desire to dominate other people? Because it keeps cropping up like weeds in the spring garden, doesn't it? This desire. Well, the answer is in Bethlehem's manger lay the answer. On Calvary's cross came the solution to break our power of domination. Into a world of lostness comes the saving Son of God. Luke 19.10 records Jesus' precious words, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Great verse. That verse comes in the context of his having saved Zacchaeus, who some thought beyond redemption, because Zacchaeus was a little bitty short guy, probably a little angry fella, who's taxing everybody and who's, who's just... Mean. Nobody likes Zacchaeus. He climbs up in the sycamore tree. It's Jesus he wants to see. And Jesus invites him to himself. And Zacchaeus finds redemption. But the question always is begging, how are you going to save the likes of Zacchaeus? Or you or me? I mean sinners. Mean old nasty self-serving sinners. Well, in Bethlehem's manger lay the answer. Amen. On Calvary's cross came the solution into a world of death, bottom line, comes the living Son of God. As many of us have done, Jesus was traveling to the tomb of a close friend, Lazarus. And as he travels there, the man, Lazarus' sister, met him on the road. And to her broken yet believing heart, if you read it in context, she understands that there's resurrection. He said these breathtaking words in John 11, 25, and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Amen. Death comes even around the holidays. I heard of someone this morning who passed away this very morning. That's sad, isn't it? But Jesus came. Calvary, first Bethlehem, whipped. Death. How could death be whipped? Well, in Bethlehem's manger lay the answer. On Calvary's cross came the solution. We can never, ever, ever divorce Christmas and Easter, can we? That, that the baby that came went. But here, we've been saying in Bethlehem's manger lay the answer. On Calvary's cross came the solution. I think here we're obligated to say, to add, on the third day came the victory. Amen. Amen. Amen? Because that is indeed what it's all about. The inseparable truth. But you can't separate the stable from the tomb. In, in one, Jesus came forth from Mary, and the other, he came forth from death. And it is on Christmas that we celebrate the birth of Jesus, who had come God with us to fix us. In Bethlehem's manger lay the answer on Calvary's cross 
and the solution. I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Maybe sort of a short message this morning. But I want to say to you a Merry Christmas. And remember this in your heart during this season. When you think about the wonderful celebration, the reason that we have hope is that Jesus came. And the reason that the world is singing along is that he changed the world. And the hope that we have, the opportunity we have this season and all through the year is to share with others the good news that God really was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That if any man is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And there's even a possibility that someone may be here this morning in your family. You came with your family. You, it's Christmas. You ought to come to church. It's something you do. But you've never really experienced the born again experience with the man, Jesus Christ. You, you think the story of Christmas and the baby's nice, but you don't have a personal relationship with him. And you can. And that's the whole purpose of it all. Jesus wouldn't have come to Bethlehem's manger if he didn't need to go to Calvary's cross. Yeah. Father, we thank you for your word. As we come now into a time of invitation, I pray that you'll work in hearts and lives for your glory. We praise you for this Christmas season. In Jesus' name.